forms that will lead to India moving quickly up the ease of doing business. And so we have a range of different issues that we talk about. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, intellectual property rights. One of them has to do with uh, ease of starting a business. One of them has to do with tax transparency. And so there are a lot of different elements that go into it. Enforcement of contracts, uh, the ability uh, to, to take money out that's invested, right? Um, one aspect that will be extremely helpful as we look at the budget session coming up, uh, the intention of the government is to introduce uh, a new bankruptcy bill to, to create a new bankruptcy law. It's a major, major gap in India's uh, uh, commercial capability is that you have a way to get in, but it's a very, very difficult to get out. And so developing that, I think, will be a, a enormously positive uh, impact. So, so in that dialogue, um, we have uh, uh, an exchange of views. And it, and it goes both ways. So for example, uh, the Indian government will come to the United States government and say, you know, you have this thing called Social Security. So many of our uh, 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 young people go to the United States, they get a job, they get an H-1B visa, they contribute to your Social Security, that's fine. But then they leave and come back to India, and their contribution stays in the United States. And they never been. Does that sound fair? Well, maybe not, right? So, so that's also part of, of the dialogue, how to address issues like that. So it's a, a give and take on both sides about the issues that we have. But mostly, the fundamental sort of basis of that dialogue and that discussion is that having a closer economic relation, having more trade and more investment will benefit the United States. It will benefit India. And it's a win-win. So it's a common goal to achieve this growth in investment and growth in trade. Now, um, there are a few issues with this. Maybe they'll come up in the Q's and A's. I won't go further onto that because I want to talk. There are, there are four threads of this uh, discussion. The second thread has to do with standards. And here, our discussion with India has to do um, I'll, I'll give you sort of a framework of what we're talking about. So if I am going to import um, an agricultural commodity, there is a, a, a international standards, Codex Alimentarius, which describes how you assess whether that is uh, an acceptable import. Now, every country has the sovereign right, the United States has it, and India has it, to set up their own system. There's no requirement or obligation that you have to adhere to this accepted international standard. But when you think about how to facilitate trade, if you can imagine if you are an exporter exporting wheat to 50 countries around the world, if you had to have 50 times your product tested and 50 times going to 50 different laboratories get 50 different analytical results to allow you to, to, to export to 50 different countries, what is the efficiency, or let's say the gross inefficiency of that, what is the loss in terms of cost and, and delay of trade? So having individual country standards for everything is why that inefficiency is why you develop common international standards. So part of this dialogue on standards is to uh, reach an agreement with India. Look, if India has a particular reason why one particular product, or two, or three, or five, that India has India-specific requirements that are different from those of the rest of the world, then that's fine. Set a special standard for those So that's the question on standards. Um, I gave an example of agriculture, but in, in IT and, and uh, some other components, there are a number of other areas in which India is, is at least contemplating having its own standards when there are pre-existing international standards. The third and fourth I'll, I'll bring together is our discussions about innovation and entrepreneurship and smart cities. And so these encompass areas of sustainability, they, uh, of dynamism, uh, of 
the, the sorts of things that the Professor Mishra was talking about when he said that India and the United States working together can benefit the world. In fact, it's very telling that you said that. I don't, I don't know if you were drawing from it or, or you just somehow managed to, to think of it, but when the President Obama and Prime Minister Modi met together, uh, when, when President Obama came for the uh, Republic Day, all right, not this year, but one year ago, in their joint statement, one of the lines that we quote often, because we think it's very important and very significant, is that India and the United States, their bilateral, our bilateral relations with each other, benefit each of us. All right? Our relationship benefits India. Our relationship benefits the United States. But in some ways, what is even mo more exciting and important is how that bilateral relationship can in turn benefit the world. So it's very much exactly the kind of uh, image that you described yourself in the introduction. So thank you. Um, so, so we're very excited about that. And entrepreneurship and innovation is one area where, where what the, we accomplished together can benefit the world. President Obama, when he first came in eight years ago or seven years ago now, he instituted uh, a global entrepreneurship summit. And the first one was in Washington, I believe, and then the, every year they had them since in different countries around the world. Who knows, maybe next year it'll be in India, it'll be great, maybe even Hyderabad. But the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, he said, look, the, it's not a, a nationalist thing uh, in terms of what country or another country develops an innovation <coughs> that benefits the world. Wherever it is developed, it can benefit the whole world. So certainly India, with the, the Prime Minister's new concept of stand-up startup, uh, is a prime country with young people, innovators, well-educated, who can push forward the concept of innovation and entrepreneurship to develop the solutions to the problems that we have now, and maybe the solutions to the problems we haven't even imagined yet. Right? Part of being an entrepreneur is to imagine a solution to a problem that people don't even know is a problem. So that is one other area where we have a, a common discussion. Now before I go to questions and answers, I did say I was going to talk a little bit about some of the areas of concern, uh, or you might say uh, potential problems on the road ahead. The first one I would, I would cite uh, is the, the global economic environment. Right now, you know, we had the, the financial crisis, um, and uh, it, it, it was much more severe um, than anyone had expected. Um, in the United States, we talk about it being the, the most significant recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. So it's a, it was a, a, a powerful uh, hit uh, on our economy. The United States has rebounded probably better than, than many other countries in the world. But throughout the world, the level of economic activity has still not resumed to where it was. And when we look today around the world, we see uh, China really struggling. They're undergoing a, a major structural transition in their economy uh, with some, some significant global ripples that are occurring. And, and it turns out India and the United States at the moment are doing better than most countries around the world. It's not to say that India is doing great. And it's not to say the United States is doing great. But when you look at the comparators around the world, they're doing uh, a bit better. So there is, there is opportunity there. But there is, it, there is danger. Because uh, without that more robust global growth, there's concern that you know, if you look at the India, for example, its exports uh, on a year-on-year -year comparison have gone down every single month for 14 months now. All right, so, uh, so it, is, it is quite quite concerning. So that's an area, I don't want to sound a huge alarm, but, but that is there. One other area I would mention, which is India specific, is the level of non-performing loans uh, in the banking system. And uh, Raghuram Rajan, the, the, you know, the head of the central bank, uh, uh, RBI, is obviously, he is concerned about that, and is asking the banks to become more transparent about what those are so that that can be addressed uh, in the banking system. But that, that is a concern. It can be addressed, but, but it is a little bit worrisome, I would have to say. And then the final one, I would say, which is, in, in fact, the most serious one, so I've saved it for last. And that is a, a global problem that is, has already arrived, the 
It's not something that's coming, but it is, it is going to be much, much worse over time unless we address it. Who knows what that is? Climate change. Climate change. Bingo. Give that man a cookie. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. So, so the question of climate change is, is a very, very serious one and a very difficult one. It's difficult because it's a global problem and has local impacts. So when we talk about the question of climate change, we talk about mitigation and adaptation. So broadly speaking, mitigation seems we are, we're going to try to uh, not emit as much so that the problem doesn't become as great as it would otherwise be if we stayed on business as usual. Adaptation says, but even though since it's going to happen anyway to some extent, what can we do on a local basis to try to make sure that the impact on us is not so serious? So for example, I would say in India, when I talk about this threat, the, threat, the biggest threat for India as I would see it is that your economy is so hugely tied to the monsoon. Climate change says probably there will be changes in the monsoon. I can't tell you what those changes will be. Will it be stronger? Will it be weaker? Will it be more frequent? Will it be less frequent? Will you see more drought? Will you see more floods? Or maybe all of those things. We you see much greater variability? That's probably the most likely outcome. But it, whatever it is, the impact on India's economy could be very, very serious. So working together, the United States and India, on the issue of climate change becomes very, very important. Um, so sometimes the, the effort in, in my conversations have been to say, well, climate is, is a separate issue. If you want to talk about climate, fine. Economics and business and commercial things are a separate issue. That's fine. But how do you separate when you have floods going into the New York subway from Hurricane Sandy? Is that a climate issue or is that an economic issue? It's both. It's both. So we will need to work together. This is a common threat. It's a threat to humanity. It's not a threat to India. It's not a threat to the United States. It's a threat to all of us. And all of us need to work together uh, to address it. So I uh, hate to leave on that, that worrisome note. So let me say on the positive side, we reached an agreement in uh, uh, Paris in December. Uh, it is an agreement that by itself will not solve the problem, but it contains uh, a process by which it can be steadily improved so that over time it can address the problem. And now it's up to all of us to, to carry out the, the requirements to make that work. I do want to say on this regard that I want to apologize to every one of you because what I am admitting is that my generation messed up and we're leaving a major problem to your generation to, to fix. But we will try to fix it as much as we can and, and at least leave you a process to make it better going forward in the future. So thank you very much. I appreciate the, the chance to have spoken to you. Uh, I'll stay standing up so that I can see you, but I really want to turn it over now to, to Q's days. You know, I request Kartik to bring four copies of book on climate change, six, seven, that day. I think, uh, Friends, we had a very fantastic, you know, uh, presentation. I'll just take a minute. And uh, we simply talk, you know, we touched upon a number of issues, but ease of doing business. How can we go up the ranking? How can we improve? How can we do better? IPRs, I think, is an area of concern. Tax transparency, yes. Retro tax. Then regulation, I think, you know, maybe bankruptcy law. Can we take something from the U.S. Bankruptcy Law, Section 11, I think. We have been thinking of that for quite some time. Also, trade, I think, is another issue. Very, very important issue is trade, you know, trade, you know, leads the flag. And I would rather suggest, I think, a day may come when two democracies, they're in different continents. One is there in North America, and we are here. I think we may, I think, create a sort of federation, which will be a very, very loose kind of thing. And I think that may be better than what you call European Economic Union, and I think you know, <coughs> many other things. So trade, I think, is an issue. Trade is something you know, which is beyond politics. Trade, I think, is the real economics, I would say. And then innovations, I think, is one thing, I think. It's innovations, I think, which can take us forward. 
if U.S. is U.S. today, is U.S. is U.S. only because of innovations. And I've been telling my friends that what is more important is, I think, the mind. What is more important is thought, not the factories, not the farm. Do you have a good idea? That idea can change the entire world. So can we have innovations? And that's where I think U.S. and India have to work together. U.S. takes the lead. They're the leaders in the world. We have good minds here. And a leader with good minds, I'm sure that it will not be 2 plus 2, 4. I think it will be so many, I think, tools together. And then there are areas of concern, I think. And one area which you have found, I think, which brings, there may be politics, there may be economics, there may be regionalism. But there are areas, you know, which transcend all these things. And that is, I think, climate change. I fully agree with you. Maybe that we are from the peace generation, you and I, they are from the present generation. But they should not hand down this problem to the other generation. I agree. So I think let us solve that. And on that, uh, please, I think if you have some questions, some observations, yes, Pragya, please. Right. Uh, you spoke about ease of doing business. In India, there are a lot of laws and acts which are actually for the protection of our small scale industries, which do not reach or survive to the level of these national business or going, to, uh, going uh, forward to the global level. There has to be very delicate balance between making the laws and liberalizing to the extent where we move up to the right. According to you, which one would be the best measures India could possibly take maintaining the uh, balance of the internal economy as well as developing the external economy? So that's a very good question. Um, here is the reality. Anytime you have economic change, there will be benefit, there will be those who will benefit and those who will be harmed by that change. Pretty much without exception. So if your concern is only on preventing harm, you can do that as long as you are willing to give up all the benefit. If you are willing to only con uh, to address the benefit and ignore the harm, you may have social unrest, you may have uh, uh, significant problems that accrue from that. So that, I think, is the kind of balance, right? The delicate balance that you're talking about. If the United States had said, um, you know, 100 and, and, uh, years ago or a little more, no, 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 all of these Horse and buggy drivers, they have these jobs, they can't lose their jobs, we will not allow any automobiles in the United States. No factories to make automobiles, no automobiles. Well, the United States would still be running around with horses and buggies, but would we be in a successful economy? Obviously not. So the horse and buggy drivers, uh, and the stable boys, and all of the people who work to take care of the horses and buggies, the people who made the wagon wheels and all of the, that, those people, they got hurt because the economy changed. It changed to the automobile and uh, within a couple of decades there were no more horses and buggies. And so there was a cost. You know, I, you can't say, oh, it was all benefit. It wasn't all benefit. If you were a stable boy uh, or a stable girl, uh, you didn't have a job anymore because there weren't all these horses taking buggies around. On the other hand, a brand new industry that never existed before created thousands, if not perhaps even millions of jobs making automobiles. So you have to be willing to accept the cost in order to gain the benefit when there's economic change and economic transition. What is needed when you do that, though, and I think this comes back to your point, if you are going to do that, you have to recognize, the government has to recognize, okay, if we make this transition, this is the category of people, of workers, who may be hurt by that change. What can we do as a government to help them, to train them, to provide them some assistance, whatever it might be, to allow for that economic transition to occur that will overall benefit your economy and benefit your society, but will in the process hurt some people? And so, you know, there is no cookie cutter answer to that. It will depend on a case by case, by case basis. But of course, it is incumbent on the government to recognize not just the benefit, but also the cost and to do what it can as a government to soften the blow to those who will be hurt as you make that economic transition. Answer your question. I think this is a very important issue. Mm -hmm. In 1964, we had Holy Spirit Challenge. Mm -hmm. In Holy Spirit Challenge, we did a work, we did a movie, and that was titled as 
distributing growth. So I think data is issue, you know, how elementary can you grow through the data and you know, how we can do just we can grow and still I think we can take uh, the persons, we can keep concerns of people who are not. At least more questions like okay. So my name is Narendra Nath. I am a teacher in IPE, that is the Institute of Public Enterprise. If I am to summarize your presentation briefly, it would be IPE. That is, it's been inspirational, it's been persuasive, it's been educative and entertaining. You are I have two questions to ask you. The first question is, in the course of your presentation, you talked about the trade between India and America being X at a certain point in time. And in five years or so, you wanted to make it five times more. Or without fixing a time line. Without, without fixing a time line. Without, 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 yeah, without fixing a timeline, you wanted to ensure it was five times more. Right. But the words which you said after that was, it had less to do with India and America. That is, the non-accomplishment of that five times, if I mistake not, the words which you used there, it had less to do with India and America. In other words, the other extraneous factors and so on. Now, when I keep reading the papers, you know, what I mean is right now, within the last one or two years, okay. that increase has slowed. Within the last one or two years, it has been more to do with the global environment than our relationship. Right, but I personally believe, because if we find so much <coughs> literature about America and so on, every article seems to be saying that America is not growing. And because America is not growing, other countries are not growing. Nowadays, it's fashionable to blame it on China, but that's another matter. Mm -hmm. America is not growing. Now, most of the crisis, as you are, I hope you wouldn't mind, most of these crises started with the subprime, global, financial, and so on. So that is one question, but you said just now that it is a recent happening. The second thing is I want to know what are two suggestions or advice which you would give to Mr. Narendra Modi. I'll tell you why I'm asking the question. The amount of Paris yesterday and the New York Times of yesterday, both of them have lamented what is happening.